This is the pre-lab video for the experiment Dehydration of 2-Methylcyclohexanol in the Evelyn Effect. In this experiment, you'll carry out the acid-catalyzed dehydration of a mixture of cis and trans 2-methylcyclohexanol. As this reaction proceeds, product mixture will be distilled out of the reaction and collected in two fractions. After purifying the fractions, they'll be analyzed by gas chromatography. Like many elimination reactions, this one produces a mixture of alkene regioisomers. Curiously, though, the relative amount of these regioisomers is different in the two fractions. In the analysis of your data, you'll explore how the conformations of the starting alcohols influence the rates of the re their reaction and the products that they can form in order to explain the difference between the two fractions. In this presentation, I'll be covering the pre-lab assignment, safety considerations, the goals of the experiment and the methods that will be used to achieve them, background information about the reaction, some information about conducting the experiment, how to clean up at the end of the experiment, and some pointers on completing your data analysis. In addition to reading the assigned sections in Techniques in Organic Chemistry and your lecture textbook, you'll need to watch an additional video entitled The Introduction to Gas Chromatography. You also need to prepare your notebook. For the first time, you will be using the preparative format for your notebook, so be sure to review the laboratory notebook section of your lab manual, specifically the format for preparative experiments. You'll see that additional sections are required and must be completed before you come to lab. These include drawing the main reaction, compiling a data table for reagents and products, and calculating the theoretical yield. With regard to that theoretical yield, you'll note that in this experiment, a single starting material produces multiple isomeric products. While you can't predict the theoretical yield of each individual product, you can predict the theoretical yield of all of the products combined, and that's what you should calculate. Safety information for this experiment includes that 2-methylcyclohexanol is flammable and irritating, and phosphoric acid is extremely corrosive. Thus, you should prevent eye, skin, and clothing contact while working on this uh, lab. And you should avoid, in avoid inhaling vapors and ingesting these compounds. The goal of this experiment is to see how the relative amounts of elimination products change during the dehydration reaction of a mixture of cis and trans 2-methylcyclohexanols, and then to explain that change using some conformational analysis and an understanding of mechanisms. To achieve that goal, you'll carry out the dehydration on a micro scale and collect the products in two small fractions. You'll then purify those fractions using a microscale extraction, and after drying, you will analyze those fractions by gas chromatography. The dehydration of an alcohol has long been a common experiment to do in organic chemistry labs. The reagents are inexpensive, the reaction times are relatively short, and a quick gas chromatographic analysis can show how these reactions follow Zaitsev's rule. The dehydration of 2-methylcyclohexanol is particularly good starting material since it presents the possibility of some carbocation rearrangement. Also, the products are easily distilled out of the reaction as an azeotrope that can be quickly purified and analyzed by GLC GC. This experiment however, goes one step farther based on a curious observation made by Professor Todd of Pomona College in 1994. Like many laboratory professors, he was carrying out the reaction on a batch of 2-methylcyclohexanol to ensure that the reagent gave the expected results before the students ran the reaction in the following weeks. About halfway through the slow distillation, he was summoned to lunch with the departmental secretary, Evelyn. So he turned off the heat source, allowed the reaction to cool, sealed up the receiving flask, which had half the product in it, and went to lunch, knowing he could simply heat it up when he returned and pick up where he left off. 
when he returned from lunch, and purely out of curiosity, instead of using the same receiving flask, he replaced it with a new one and finished the distillation. He then analyzed those fractions separately. And here's what he found. The first fraction, containing the product collected before lunch with Evelyn, was composed of 93% 1-methylcyclohexene, 7% 3-methylcyclohexene, and just a trace of methylene cyclohexane. The second fraction, collected after lunch, however, contained nearly equal amount of 1-methylcyclohexene and 3-methylcyclohexene, and again a trace of methylene cyclohexane. Since Professor Todd collected these fractions only because of a lunch date with Evelyn, he named the curious effect after her. The fact that these two fractions have different compositions begs the question, why? Well, the most important thing to recognize is that there is not one, but rather two starting materials in the reaction, both cis and trans 2-methylcyclohexanol, in nearly equal molar amounts. And these two isomers behave differently under the conditions of the reaction. Your analysis will explore how and why they do. Here are some things to be mindful of when conducting the experiment. When you carry out the reaction and distillation, you'll be working with a partner and you'll be sharing data. Unlike large-scale reactions, when using microscale glassware, you should never let the thermal well come in contact with the distilling flask. There should be a small air gap around and under the flask. In the separation, you will be, for the first time, doing extraction on microscale. For this, instead of using a separatory funnel, you use a centrifuge tube and a pasture pipette. It's important that you work very carefully because of the small quantities involved. It's also important that you use only the necessary amount of drying agent at the end of the purification process. Too much will make it difficult to recover enough product to analyze. For the analysis, you simply need to bring your samples to your instructor, who will inject them into the gas chromatograph and provide you with the data at printout. Cleaning up at the end of this experiment consists of pouring the residue from the distillation in the appropriate waste container, placing the used drying agent in its waste container, pouring the product fractions in the waste container, washing all of your glassware, and restocking and returning the microscale kit. Data analysis. One of the first things you will need to do in the analysis of your results is determine the ratio of 1-methylcyclohexene to 3-methylcyclohexene in the fractions you collected. You get this information from the data supplied on your chromatograms. A typical example looks like this. At the top is the chromatogram showing peaks for each component detected in the sample. The numbers at the top of each peak are the retention times in minutes for each one. For example, the first peak has a retention time of 2.44 minutes. You should note that the time is measured in minutes, not minutes and seconds. So that is 2.44 minutes, not 2 minutes and 44 seconds. Below the chromatogram is a data table for the peaks, listed in order of retention time. The area column of the table gives relative values for the area under each of the peaks. For example, the peak that has a retention time of 2.44 minutes has an area value of 9,077,826. As is typical of most computer-based data stations, this has too many significant figures. The data isn't nearly this precise, and you should be rounded to only four significant figures. So 9,077,826 becomes 9,078,000. Standards for each of the products have previously been analyzed to determine their retention times, and it was found that 3-methylcyclohexene comes off the column first, at around 2.4 to 2.5 minutes. The trace amount of cyclohexane, or methylene cyclohexane, comes off second at around 2.6 minutes, and 1-methylcyclohexene comes off last at about 2.8 minutes. 
In this sample, we can clearly see the 3-methylcyclohexene at 2.44 minutes and the 1-methylcyclohexene at 2.8 minutes. If you look closely, there is a small peak in between that is a trace amount of the methylene cyclohexane at around 2.6 minutes. The two peaks that come off much later in the chromatogram, around 5 minutes, are unreacted starting material, the 2-methylcyclohexanols. You may find that the retention times for your analysis are different than those given here, but the relative order will remain the same. Ask your instructor if you're unsure of which peak corresponds to which compound. Once you've identified the peaks corresponding to the major products of the reaction, you can determine their relative percents from the area values. In this e example, the peaks at 2.44 minutes and 2.8 minutes. We can express their relative percents by taking the area of each peak, rounded to an appropriate number of significant figures, and dividing by the sums of the area of both and multiplying by 100. So the percent of 3-methylcyclohexene would be calculated as 9,078,000 divided by 9,078,000 plus 60,630,000 times 100, which comes out to be 13.02%. It's important that that is a relative percent relative to the 1-methylcyclohexene, and it would be calculated in an analogous manner. Finally, a good deal of additional work is required to complete the analysis of this experiment. Accordingly, you should draft your answers on scrap paper before writing your final answers in your notebook. You must do full conformational analysis of both the cis and trans methylcyclohexanols that illustrate both chair conformations for each. Your model kit will be a great aid in doing this. All of your drawings need to be clear and accurate in order for you to draw the right conclusions and to convey those conclusions in your answers. Finally, your written explanations need to be clear and should be concise. 